Have you ever considered how many crises exist? So throughout the whole span of history, how many different crises have there been and how many different kinds? Financial crises, uh, war crises, economic, pollution, a crisis of pollution, environmental crises of various sorts, labor crisis, water crisis, food crisis, and of course what we're facing today, a health crisis. Sometimes it, it seems like life moves from crisis to crisis. Some are personal, some are local, and some, like the COVID-19 virus, is global. And the church has seen its own share of crises through history. Uh, some were internal problems within the church. Some were caused by persecution, and that's still going on today in certain parts of the world. Uh, some were theological or doctrinal, a crisis of theology, a crisis of determining and understanding what is it that the church believes. Some were simply because the church is still in the world, and as the world faces a crisis, the church faces it as well because the church is still in the world. And that's the case with the global pandemic that we're facing today that we're living through. This crisis is not unique to the church, but the church faces it along with the rest of humanity. How do you think the church should respond in the face of a crisis? Today, we're going to examine the reaction of the early church to the very first hint of a crisis. And I want to draw parallels between how the early church responded to that crisis or the beginning of that crisis and then to us today in light of the coronavirus. The text is going to be Acts 4 verses 23 through 31. But before I read it, I want to set the scene because we're picking up the story in the middle. The church is just a few weeks, maybe a couple months old. The day of Pentecost had come and gone. The Holy Spirit had descended upon the disciples and other believers. And this new community, this church, was growing daily. Up until this point, they had been in favor with the general population. They had a good reputation. And in this social climate, Peter and John, two pillars of this brand new community, go to the temple in Jerusalem at the time of prayer. On their way in, they are stopped by a crippled beggar who asks them for money. Now, uh, Peter was one of the first missionaries, right? And he was poor uh, and uh, a fisherman. And he turns to the beggar and he says, you know what? I, I don't have silver or gold. In other words, I don't have any money to give you. But what I do have to give you, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Most of you know the rest of the story. The man is immediately healed, and he follows John and Peter into the temple. And the scripture says that he was walking and leaping and praising God. This may be the first time this man had ever walked in his life. And now he's not only walking, but he's dancing, and he's jumping, and he's praising God. I'm sure it was quite a scene. Now, of course, all these people near them, who had seen what happened, were amazed. So Peter and John, again, as good missionaries, they took advantage of the attention that they had gathered to preach the gospel. Now this caused a political and social uproar. And the long and the short of the story is that the two apostles were arrested and they spent the night in jail. And the next morning, they were brought before the governing body of the Jews, which was called the Sanhedrin. They were the, the governing religious body. And the Sanhedrin eventually let them go that same day, but they warned them strongly. They told Peter and John, you may not speak in the name of Jesus anymore. So we're going to let you go, but this is a compromise. You can go, but you can't speak about Jesus. And I love the way Peter and John responded. They said, we're sorry. <laughs> Sorry, not sorry, really, is, is what they said. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, we cannot help but speak in the name of Jesus because there's no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. So we're going to leave because you're letting us go, but we do not agree 
to not speak in the name of Christ. Peter and John returned to their community, the early church, and they shared with the church everything that had happened to them. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. So the church is just getting the very first taste of a huge crisis that is going to define the church and ultimately define history. Because in just a few days, terrible persecution is going to break out against the church in Jerusalem. And the church, as you know from your church history, it's going to be scattered. Those believers are going to be scattered all through the known world, fleeing for their lives in many cases. So this arrest and overnight stay in jail for Peter and John is just the first little taste. Now, I I have finally had to surrender to the fact that um, I can't see the print in this Bible anymore. Uh, until I get reading glasses like Joel Rast has, who's older than I am. So um, I'm going to uh, actually have to read from a pew Bible this morning because I can actually see the text, which is helpful if you're trying to read. Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. How did the church respond? Their immediate response was to go to prayer. And I think that's a very simple uh, application for, for us today, that in any crisis, our first reaction, may it be prayer, and may it be immediate. That's a good, right, and appropriate response. Uh, I take my cue here from Pastor Bill, my dad. I don't know how many of you have ever spoken to him, maybe in the foyer after a service, or anywhere else around this church complex, or in his home or on the street or wherever it might be, if you share a need with him, Pastor Bill will say, right then, let's pray, let's pray right now. It might be on the phone, it might be outside, it might be inside, wherever it is. And, and that should be our cue as, as a church. Any, any question, even any hint of a crisis or uncertainty, our first response, let's go to the Lord. But the content of this prayer is where we will see the heart of this new church's reaction. So I want us to look at the content of this prayer and derive what we can to apply to us today. They begin this prayer um, with three aspects of truth focus. So they're drawing their hearts and their minds to truth. They're affirming truth in three different ways. The first way is through praise. Who God is and what he has done. That's how they start. Sovereign Lord, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. A crisis can so quickly overwhelm us that our sentiments and reactions are often ones of fear. So the crisis itself seems so big that it takes up all of our vision. And when that happens, we lose perspective. You know, with, uh, with smartphones today, 
when you have a photo on your screen, you can zoom in really close. And you can zoom in so close that you actually can't tell what the original photo was. And that's, that's what happens often in case of crisis. It, it, that, that crisis becomes so big, we're so zoomed in on it that we can't see anything else. When we get too when we get focused too tightly on the situation and the fear and the anxiety and the speculation, we can't keep truth in perspective. So praising God helps us zoom out. It puts the crisis in its appropriate perspective. It doesn't make the crisis unimportant. It doesn't make it meaningless. It doesn't minimize it, but it just puts it in its right perspective underneath the almighty power of God. So praise is not only right because it's right for us to glorify God, but it also plays a role for us as we affirm those truths about who God is, about what he's done, it draws our hearts, it draws our minds to a right perspective on the crisis. God, as we zoom out, we see God in his appropriate role as creator, as sovereign, as merciful, as good, as redeemer, as savior. The second way that these believers make a truth claim is that they draw the word of God to apply to their situation. They affirm that God was, was not only the creator, but also that he had spoken by his spirit. So we have praise, which refers to who God is and what he has done, and then a focus on scripture, on God's word. So what has God said? How has God in his word spoken to this crisis, spoken to our situation today? The word of God does speak into our reality. We need to be careful to interpret it clearly and rightly. That's, that's a caution. But it is relevant and true. In the case of the early church, they knew the scripture and so they applied it correctly to their situation. They basically said what God had already told them through his word, what, that, that earthly rulers and authorities are going to oppose the truth. So this was David speaking truth in the Old Testament, speaking both into his circumstance, but also prophetically for the future, that throughout history, earthly rulers and earthly authorities and even spiritual authorities, they are going to oppose truth. They're going to oppose Jesus. They're going to oppose God. They, 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 they affirmed, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. So they, they're kind of saying, Lord, we, we shouldn't be shocked by this situation. We shouldn't be shocked that the Sanhedrin was opposing Peter and John. We shouldn't be shocked that the religious leaders are opposing the good news of Christ. We shouldn't be. Because you've already told us in your word this is going to happen. And scripture keeps us true. It keeps us obedient. It keeps us walking in God's way. One of my uncles is a pilot. He pilots just small planes. And when, uh, when I was growing up, he had a, a little small four-seater airplane. And every time we got to go visit him, he would take us up in that airplane. And uh, it was fun. And he would do crazy things to kind of make us get sick and, and scared. But it was entertaining scared. Uh, but one thing I remember him showing me, the, the different instruments on his, his, like the dashboard of the plane. And there were two that he pointed out specifically. One was the altimeter, which tells the, the, the pilot how high the plane is off the ground. And, <clears throat> excuse me. and then there's another instrument called the artificial horizon. And what the artificial horizon does is it shows the pilot, if I recall correctly, if he's flying straight or if he's flying 
in a, in a curve. And so he watches that instrument and it lets him know if he's flat or if he's crooked. Now, what's the point? If it's a beautiful day, and the pilot can look out the windows of the plane. He can see where he is. He has an idea of how far off the ground he is. But if it's cloudy, or if they fly into a cloud bank, my uncle explained to me, your senses get completely deceived. So it will feel like you're going up when you're actually going down. And it's so hard. He said it is so, the, the feeling is overpowering. And so you're, you're, you feel compelled to try to fix it. I'm going up higher and higher and higher. No, I need to go down when you're already going down. And the same thing can be true. He said, you can be flying perfectly level, but it feels like you're turning and getting off course. So the point he was making to me is when a pilot flies into cloud or fog, they have to watch those two instruments because those are the ones that will tell them the truth. So no matter how it feels... No matter what sensation the pilot may have, those will keep him level and high enough. He said, if you give in to your instincts, you'll crash. And I want to compare those two instruments to the Word of God. They keep us true. So if we focus on our circumstances... If that's our primary focus, we're going to crash. If we're focused on the Word of God and the truth that He speaks into our situation... He will keep us true. He will keep us level. He will keep us straight. The word interprets circumstances, not the other way around. Now, I did also say that we have to be careful that we interpret and apply Scripture rightly. Uh, so, for instance, just as an example in, in what we face today, so maybe we read Exodus and we say, oh, God sent plagues on Egypt. Okay, this COVID is a plague on, and we choose a country um, that we want to choose. Uh, the United States, Brazil, Europe, China, whatever it is, we choose one and we say, oh, so this is God's judgment on that country. Well, let me tell you something. It could be. I'm not going to limit that and say it can't be. But we can't take that directly from Exodus and the story of the plagues. But what we can do is we can say, okay, God in the past, in history, God has used natural plagues to accomplish his purpose and will. And then we look at our situation today and we can, we, then we can ask the Lord, Lord, is that what you're doing today? We know that you have done that in the past. We know that you are capable of doing that. What are you doing? How are you using this today? Show us if we need to know. Maybe we don't need to know. So they make a truth claim through praise. They make a truth claim by focusing on Scripture. And thirdly, they affirm the truth of God's sovereignty. Now, I don't want to take too much time on this this week because basically this is what we talked about last Sunday. But we can't ignore it because it comes through so strongly in this prayer. The early believers are totally convinced not only of God's permissive sovereignty, but of His active sovereignty. And what I mean by that is that they're, they're convinced not only that God's in control and he's allowing things to happen, but that he is active in making them happen. So they, they speak about Herod and Pilate, the Gentiles and the people, and they say all of them, all of those people were working together. They were conspiring together to destroy Jesus. That's what they were doing, to crucify him. Imagine for a moment that you are Peter, or one of the other disciples. And you're watching that scene from a distance. Jesus has been arrested. He is there at the chief priest's house, and you're watching from a distance. Your entire world is falling apart. Your hopes and your dreams are being destroyed. This Jesus, who did all those miracles, who you have come to love, who you have come to respect, who you have left everything to follow, He's being condemned, and he's going to die. Would you have felt at that moment 
that God was actively in control of that situation? No, no, no. I know, I know that today we look back on it and say, well, of course, because Jesus had to die. He had to be crucified. That was God's plan. And then he rose and he was victorious. But they didn't know that then. So as they're walking through that, could you imagine their desperation, their grief, their sorrow, how disillusioned they must have been? And yet... Here it is. The early church looks back on that event and says, those people that were bent on evil, uh, Herod, the Gentiles, Pontius Pilate, determined to destroy Jesus, they were acting in accordance with what God's power and will had decided beforehand would happen. In other words, they're affirming that, G, that God not only allowed that to happen to Jesus, but God intended, ordained, and actively made it happen. When we think of the sovereignty of God, his absolute power and authority, usually, generally, we consider that his active sovereignty is what brings about good things, and his permissive sovereignty allows bad things. Isn't that usually what we think? So if something good happens, we're like, that's because God directly intervened. Amen. Praise him. And yes, I agree he did. When something bad happens, we say, well, God stood back and he allowed that to happen. The truth of the matter is that as fallible humans, we don't know. In any given circumstance, we don't know how God in his sovereignty has moved in order for those events to take place. But the early church is convinced that it was God's active sovereignty at work to ensure that Jesus would be crucified. And I know that's really hard for us. It's hard for us to imagine that this virus that has thrown the entire world into chaos could not only have been allowed by God, but could it have been sent by God? I don't know. You don't know. But we must leave that possibility open because God is sovereign and not us. And just as just as Peter and the other disciples seeing Jesus on the path to crucifixion and then burial had no idea what was coming next. They didn't understand that a much greater, more profound grace and truth and joy was coming. We also don't know when something bad happens. We do not know the end game. We do not see the eternal consequences. And this brings us back to a question of perspective. So, Last Sunday, I gave an example about perspective and the sovereignty of God. But the sound cut out right then. So those of you who are watching or listening at home, you didn't hear it. So I get to use it again. This is perfect. So perspective and the sovereignty of God. About a year ago, uh, I got to go watch the Brazilian uh, national rugby team play against one of New Zealand's all-black teams here at Estadio do Morumbi in Sao Paulo. We had really good seats, which meant they were down close to the field. But you know the problem with those seats? Is that because we were so close to the field, we could see what was happening in front of us, but it was very difficult to see what was happening on the other side of the field. If we had been higher up in the stadium, we would have had a much more complete perspective. And this is where we have to trust the sovereignty of God. His perspective is over everything. Ours is over a small corner. We only see what's right in front of us. God sees all. So it's a call to faith. If we belong to God, if you are a child of God, then you can take comfort in the fact that he knows what he's doing. And chances are it's far beyond what you or I or any of us can ask or imagine. Three truth claims, through praise, through scripture, through the sovereignty of God. And now, and only now, does the early church come to their requests. A lot of times when we pray, we're right to the requests, right? We start, dear Jesus, thank you for this day. We might get that far. Thank you for this day. Now, here's what I need. And we list it. When I read this prayer early this last week, I was immediately struck by the requests 
that this community made of the Lord in prayer. They're aware of the danger. They acknowledge it, but they only acknowledge it briefly. All they say is one phrase, Lord, consider their threats. That's the only attention that they actually give to the crisis itself. So what do they ask God for? Do they ask for protection? Do they ask for relief from persecution? Do they ask the Lord to punish the Sanhedrin and keep the Sanhedrin in line? Do they pray for the Lord to cause them to not be noticed by the authorities? Those would have been normal, understandable requests. But that's not what they ask. Their requests are focused entirely upon the gospel. First, they ask God to enable them, even in the face of this threat, to speak his word boldly. I was so convicted by that request. I I was convicted because that's not where my heart first goes. In, In crisis or threat is my first thought for the gospel. I have to admit, not usually. And we realize, we we have to understand that they're asking God, God, give us your courage now to speak your word boldly. And that's the very thing that got Peter and John in trouble, right? What got them in trouble? They were preaching, and they were preaching in Jesus' name, and they were preaching boldly and openly. That's why they were arrested. And yet the body of Christ is so filled with the joy of the gospel that this is their first concern. Lord, don't let us be cowed. Don't allow us to be afraid. Don't allow the threats to keep us from sharing the good news. People need to hear this. People need to know about Jesus. Don't let us be afraid to speak. And then their second request continues in line with this gospel focus. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Again, what got Peter and John in trouble? Healing the lame man didn't get them in trouble, but it got them noticed. And then their preaching got them in trouble. So again, the body of Christ in Jerusalem, this baby church, is asking God to continue to do the very things that got the two apostles in trouble. And with this second request, I want to be sure and I want us to be sure and notice that the emphasis continues to be on the gospel. Their responsibility is to speak boldly, and God's responsibility is to perform the miraculous signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is the key to the second request. He is to be glorified. He is to be introduced to the people. That's the point. The normal response for anyone in the face of crisis is to take shelter, right? I mean, they're even using those terms in English, right? Shelter in place. Hunker down. Look for protection. Now, please hear me. I think we should take precautions right now in the case of this virus. I think we should be careful. I think we should follow the, the, what the government is asking us to do with staying home as much as we're able, social distancing, washing our hands, wearing masks if appropriate, not touching our face. All, all of those things I think we should do. So I'm not saying ignore this. But what I'm asking is, is our heart primarily for the gospel in this time of crisis? So the early church prays, Lord, please keep doing your part to introduce Jesus to others. And please give us the courage we need to keep doing our part. They don't ask God, help us perform signs and wonders and healings in the name of Jesus. They leave that in God's hands. God, you do that and give us the courage to speak boldly. And do you notice the result of their prayer? What happened? Like right away, God answered. And what did they end up doing? Speaking the word of God boldly. It said all of them were. It wasn't just the apostles. It wasn't just the pastors or the deacons or the elders. It wasn't just the committee heads or the committee leaders. It was all of them. And I, am, I, wonder, I, I wonder even about children because children were part of this new community, this church. It said all of them. So... I picture the kids also speaking the word of God boldly, sharing it with their friends, telling their, their, their next door neighbor, their buddy out on the street, 
telling him about this man Jesus and what he's done. These people that we've been talking about, the members of this fledgling church in Jerusalem, I want us to see them as our spiritual ancestors. So I want, to, I, I want you to, to, to imagine this connection that goes back through, through the, the centuries and through the millennia that's connecting them to us. An unbroken line of heritage and inheritance from them to us today. Our spiritual ancestors, they are not only our brothers and sisters in Christ, but they were real people that really lived and really prayed this. And they were people like, like us, they faced challenges in their daily life. There was fear, there was anxiety, there was worry. And in a sense, they're also our, our spiritual fathers and mothers because they've gone before us. So what we've received today of our faith, we've, in a sense, inherited through them. And the church today lives on in us here on earth. We're facing a crisis. It's not a crisis of persecution, at least not yet. But it is a crisis of a global pandemic that is radically transforming life as we know it. And we don't know if life will ever go back to what it was before. So is there anything that we can learn from our spiritual forebears? Can the example of those who have gone before us speak truth to us even today? I believe so. It's not wrong for us to pray for protection from COVID-19. It's not sinful to ask God to keep us safe and healthy and well. It's not selfish to ask God to provide for our needs and the needs of our church. God has asked his people to approach him with our needs and our requests. But here's the challenge. That's where we usually stop. Let's not stop there. Let's seek the Lord to open our hearts to the joy of the spread of the good news of Jesus. This day is a great day for the gospel. This era in which we live is a great season for the good news because people are looking for answers. It's an incredible time for the truth of Jesus Christ. So let us not only be inward in our thinking and in our praying, but let us be outward. Lord, give us boldness to speak your word in this time of fear, worry, and anxiety. May we have your courage to take each opportunity that may come to share your message boldly. So may our hearts be turned first to you and to the gospel. Praise God. Pray daily and intentionally. Let, let's make this practical. Pray. I think most of you probably do. But I'm going to call us to it again. Pray daily and intentionally. And in our prayers, praise God for who he is and what he has done so that our perspective is adjusted. Read his word. Know it. And with his wisdom, apply his word to the situation we face daily. Affirm and trust his total sovereignty and power. And remember that this day, each day, is a great day for the gospel. And we have a role in that. May our prayers be also outward focused as we ask the Lord to spread his truth through us. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge that we are very often self-focused and that that is, a, a, that is a true descriptor of humanity. But by your grace, you have called us up and out of ourselves. You have called us up and out to you and to others, to look to you and to others. And as we meditate on and consider the way that our spiritual forebears, our spiritual mothers and fathers prayed in a time of crisis, 
may we be drawn to the same, that our focus would be first upward and then outward. Lord, how do you want to use us? How, not only how, but would you please spread your gospel and bring new souls to Jesus through us in these coming days and weeks and months. In Christ's name we pray, amen.